Hello everyone. We are going to discuss about the spectroscopy, which is an important technique for the structural elucidation of organic compounds. Spectroscopy not only helps for the organic compounds, even for other molecules also. Even complex molecules can be elucidated the structure by using this technique. Before going to the definition of spectroscopy, now we will see some introduction to spectroscopy. Whenever we say spectroscopy, we need to mention about the important types of energy radiations. They are nothing but electromagnetic radiations. In short, it is called EMR. E -M -R. It is electromagnetic radiations. What are these electromagnetic radiations? The name itself is indicating these are the radiations. These are the rays which has got the property of both electricity as well as magnetic property. Imagine this is the electromagnetic radiation represented by a big arrow. Now you can see two types of waves here. One is blue color, another one is red color. The red color represents the magnetic field, whereas blue color represents the electric field. That means whenever you speak of electromagnetic radiation or you speak of any light, they will be having both electrical property as well as magnetic property. And also this electrical and magnetic field, they always will be perpendicular to each other. That means once one is like this, another one will be like this. So this EMR behave both as a wave as well as a particle. Sir, what is the wave? You can see here, wave is this. It will have one hump, one bowl shape. One hump, one bowl shape. We will come to that later. Also, it behaves as particle. What is particle? I will see in the next few minutes. Now, we can describe this in a EMR as the wave occurring simultaneously in electric as well as magnetic field. I said this behaves as particle. These particles consist of tiny energy packets and these tiny energy packets are known as quanta or photons. Photons are nothing but tiny energy packets and these are the energy which are responsible for the absorption of the molecules. Coming to some basic terminologies, I said a wave. A wave, you can imagine an ocean. In ocean, there will be high tides. High tides, nothing but waves. A wave will have a crust and a trough. What is crust? Crust is nothing but a hump. A trough is nothing but a bowl. Now we have to understand two important terminologies in spectroscopy. One is wavelength represented by lambda. Another one is frequency represented by nu. What is a wavelength? Now imagine there is a wave. A wave will have numerous crusts and numerous troughs. The distance between the distance between two crusts or two troughs is known as wavelength. What is wavelength? It is the distance between two crests or two troughs. So crest is nothing but a hump, a trough is nothing but a bowl. When you take the distance between these two, then it is represented by wavelength that is represented by lambda. And then what is the unit of wavelength? Wavelength is expressed in meters, millimeters. We know that one millimeter is equal to 10 raised to minus three meters. It can be expressed in micrometers. One micrometer is equal to 10 raised to minus six meter. Also, it can be expressed in nanometer. One nanometer is equal to 10 raised to minus nine meter. Sometimes even wavelength is also expressed in angstroms. Coming to frequency, it is represented by nu. I said that a wave will have numerous crusts and numerous troughs. Now imagine a line which is running in the middle of the wave. Whatever the hump comes above the line, you call it as crest. Whatever the bowl you get below the line, you call it as trough. Now I said that a wave will have numerous crests and numerous troughs. Then you should know what is one complete cycle. A one complete cycle means it should have one crest and one trough. So one crest and one trough is known as one complete cycle. If I say half cycle, there will be either only trough or only, only trough or only crest. If I have both crest and a trough, then it is called as one complete cycle. Now coming to the definition of my uh, frequency. So frequency is defined as the number of complete cycles per second. In one second, in one second, 
how many cycles you are going to get say here in this representation in this figure i have shown you two cycles from here to here one cycle from here to here another cycle right so in one second how many this kind of complete cycles you get that you express in terms of frequency the unit of frequency is either cps that is cycles per second or hertz it is represented by hz hertz is the name of the scientist who discovered this and hence in the honor of him they have named it as hertz as the unit of frequency now we have to understand an important relationship between frequency and wavelength we know the equation mu is equal to c by lambda where mu is frequency c is velocity of light and lambda is wavelength so velocity or speed of light is 3 into 10 raised to 10 centimeters per second also we know the famous energy equation e is equal to h nu where e is energy h is planck's constant nu is frequency we know that nu is nothing but c by lambda substitute this value c by lambda in nu that is it becomes h into c by lambda now we can see that h is constant c has got the definite value and we can call it as a constant also so e and lambda they are becoming inversely proportional that is what is represented in this box now these are the two important relationships that you should remember as frequency increases energy also increases as frequency increases energy also increases as wavelength increases energy decreases and vice versa that means if wavelength decreases energy increases these are the two important relationship that you should understand the relationship between frequency and energy the relationship between wavelength and energy as nu increases e also increases as lambda increases e decreases having said the terminology which is uh, very much applicable to electromagnetic radiation now we will see what is this electromagnetic radiation how many types of electromagnetic radiations are there there are several types of electromagnetic radiations okay say for example you have got radio waves microwaves infrared waves visible ultraviolet x ray gamma ray etc 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 when you arrange all these electromagnetic radiations either in decreasing wavelength or increasing frequency then you get a spectrum and that spectrum is known as electromagnetic spectrum that is how the electromagnetic spectrum is defined it is the arrangement of all types of electromagnetic radiations in order of their increasing wavelength or decreasing frequency is called electromagnetic spectrum say for example this is radio waves we will have come across this in our daily life radio waves we use different radio waves we get fm in earlier days we used to have radios how do you get the frequency you get the frequency by means of this radio waves radio waves it is very very less energetic you must also remember here decreasing wavelength and increasing frequency as you move from left to right the wavelength decreases and frequency increases now the relationship between energy and frequency energy and wavelength comes into the picture here so when i say the less energy less energy means there will be more wavelength less energy more wavelength now coming to the next type of electromagnetic radiation that is microwaves we use microwave oven at home so we use it for cooking the food what kind of rays are used there we use microwaves and also they are slightly energetic than the radio waves the next comes the infrared rays in short we call it as ir that we will deal it later the next is the uv visible uv and visible see here uv and visible the regular spectrophotometers that we use in the physical chemistry laboratory or analytical chemistry laboratory and they have got quite higher energy than all the three rays the follow, uv is followed by x rays x rays we know that it is having very high energy meaning very short wavelength why we say that we need more energy because whenever we meet an accident we get fracture and we go for the radiology laboratory there we get the x ray done imagine our body is filled with 70% of water and our body has got bone bone is the hardest material in the body 
So imagine a ray, it should pass through water, it should pass through bone, that means it should have sufficiently high energy. That means X-rays are highly energetic in terms of wavelength, it has got very, very less value, followed by the gamma rays. Gamma rays has got the very highest energy and very, very less wavelength. So this is all about the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, having defined all the terminologies and basic concepts of spectroscopy, now we come at the uh, definition of spectroscopy. How we can define spectroscopy? You can split this spectroscopy into two terms, spectroscopy. Scopy is the study, spectro means spectra. Where is the spectra coming from? It is the electromagnetic spectrum. So what you do here, you take a material, that material in general we define it as matter so whenever you irradiate any matter there will be an interaction between the matter and the electromagnetic radiation when you study the interaction between matter and electromagnetic radiation and that type of study is known as spectroscopy so how spectroscopy can be defined it is defined as the study of interaction between matter and electromagnetic radiation what can be a matter an atom, a molecule, a compound, anything that surrounds us, it is called as matter. So whenever there is an interaction between matter and electromagnetic radiation, electromagnetic radiation, as I said, it can be any of this. It can be any of this. Whenever there is an interaction between matter and electromagnetic radiation, then that type of study is known as spectroscopy. Now, I said that there are different kinds of electromagnetic radiation. We will see how the frequency and wavelength will vary. Now coming to radio waves, I said that radio waves will have very, very less energy. That means very high wavelength. Look at the wavelength, it is greater than 10 centimeter. Look at the energy, it is three to 10 raised to nine hertz. It is 10 raised to plus nine hertz. That means highly energetic. Whenever the energy is more, the wavelength is less. Next comes the microwaves, infrared, visible, UV, X-ray followed by gamma ray. So that means gamma rays will have very, 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 very high energy and will have very, very lesser wavelength. This is the table which shows the electromagnetic region with their wavelength and frequency. Now, the question may be arising, uh, do, is there any different effect on different types of radiations on the molecules? The answer is definitely yes. If you use UV rays, there will be different types of effect. If you use IR rays, it will be different type of effect. If you use radio waves, there will be a different type of effect. Now we will see what is the effect of different spectroscopic techniques on the electromagnetic radiation. Here, the first column refers to electromagnetic radiation. That is, the first one is ultraviolet and visible. It is somewhat energetic, not as much as X-rays, not as least as radio waves. When you use UV and visible, the wavelength used is 200 to 800 nanometer. So within this range, you will be working with UV and visible spectrophotometer. Whenever you give UV visible energy to the molecules, there will be excitation. There will be excitation. The molecules present in the ground state, it will absorb the energy and goes to the excited state. That is what is shown here. The effect of radiation on the molecule, that is, changes in the electronic energy levels within the molecule. What information you can learn from UV visible? If there is any saturation or unsaturation in the molecule, will there be any aromatic or non-aromaticity in the molecule? So that is the information obtained by using ultraviolet and visible spectroscopy. Now coming to infrared, infrared will have small energy compared to UV visible. Whenever you supply infrared radiations to the molecules, then there will be a change in the vibrational and rotational energy levels in the molecule. You must be knowing that the molecules will always keep rotating and vibrating. So whenever you supply infrared radiation, the molecule shows changes in the vibrational as well as rotational energy levels. Then what is the application of IR? You can detect the functional groups present in the molecule. Say for example, if the molecule has got aldehyde, it will show different characteristic frequency. If the molecule has got ester functional group, it will show different functional group in the molecule. 
like that you can detect the functional group present in the molecule by using your infrared spectroscopy this is followed by nuclear magnetic resonance for nuclear magnetic resonance we use radio waves and the energy used or the frequency used is 60 to 600 megahertz this is the energy of radio frequency radiation that we use in nmr what changes you see here changes will be with respect to the magnetic property of some nuclei of atoms so that we will going to start in another few minutes so whenever you give radio waves to the molecules the magnetic property of the nuclei or atoms it changes then what information you get what is the application of nmr spectroscopy you will see how many types of carbons are there how many types of hydrogens are there what is the arrangement of hydrogen what is the arrangement of carbon all those information you get by using nmr spectroscopy the last one is mass spectrum or we call it as mass spectrometry here we will not use any of this radi electromagnetic radiation instead we use a high energetic electron beam and what is the effect of radiation here here mainly the molecule shows fragmentation or ionization ionization followed by fragmentation is the change that we see when we use mass spectrometry what is the application of mass spectrometry as the name itself is indicating in order to know the molecular weight of the compound and what is the molecular structure how different functional groups are aligned in the molecule that information you are going to get by using mass spectrometry now you must be wondering when we are not using any electromagnetic radiation but still we study this mass spectrometry under spectroscopy why because this mass spectroscopy it leads to structure of the organic compound may not be it is using electromagnetic radiation but what is happening it is showing the structure of the compound ultimately that's why it is kept under spectroscopy now this is all about the introduction for spectroscopy having read all this now we will move to the proper topic nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy in short we call it as nmr nmr you can split this into four terms nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy nuclear refers to nuclei or nucleus magnetic that means some magnetic properties there in the nucleus that means this nucleus will have magnetic property and the resonance what is resonance it is the continuous movement resonance here we speak about the movement of nucleus from one state to another state so the nucleus which has got the magnetic property it will move we will see how it moves and what happens so the study of this is known as nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy in short we call it as nmr why we have to study this nmr this nmr is a highly useful spectroscopic technique which is used for the structural elucidation of molecules as i said earlier not only organic molecules even inorganic substances can also be found out including the complex biological molecule structures can also be deduced here now you may be thinking is nmr sufficient to elucidate the structure of the compound it is not possible nmr along with other spectroscopic techniques like uv ir and mas when these are taken together then you arrive at the structure of the compound what is the important information what is the main application of spectroscopy nmr it is the arrangement of ch how hydrogens are arranged with the carbon in the organic molecules what are the different types of hydrogens how many different types of environments you are going to have in the organic molecules that is the information we are going to get it here so as i said earlier nmr mainly deals with the magnetic properties of certain atomic nuclei whenever we say magnetic property the main thing that comes in the picture is whenever we use magnet there will be north pole and south pole yes no doubt a magnet will have north pole and south pole but how it is related to the nucleus in chemistry we will see now whenever i take a nucleus even the smallest nucleus the smallest known nucleus is hydrogen nucleus even it will be spinning about its own axis that is the main property of nucleus always nucleus will not be in an ideal position it will be always spinning 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 about its own axis that is what is shown here here blue color ball represents the hydrogen nucleus and this arrow mark shows 
this arrow mark shows the direction in which it is spinning this is the axis of the spinning and this arrow mark red arrow mark shows it is circulating in the circular motion or clockwise direction that means always the nucleus it keeps on spinning we know that the nucleus is positively charged and hence the spinning nucleus will behave like a tiny magnet always you must remember the nucleus is spinning and it has got a positive charge because of that spin and the positive charge the magnet behavior comes into the nucleus this is what is shown here if the nucleus is spinning 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 like this you see here it uh, behaves like a tiny magnet as a result of spinning the charged nucleus generates a magnetic field and hydrogen the smallest known nucleus is no way exception to this even hydrogen shows nucleus spinning fine now we are talking about nuclear magnetic spectroscopy or nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy that means we have to make use of some magnet now imagine this is a figure here each circle represents hydrogen you see here the arrow marks are arranged in different directions so all the hydrogen nuclei are randomly oriented here now whenever i use an externally applied magnetic field it is represented by h not but in some books they are represented by b not b not and h not they refers to external magnetic field so whenever i keep an external magnetic field to this randomly oriented nucleus the nuclei will take two important orientations see here there are two different colors the blue represents parallel orientation and the red represents anti parallel orientation so that is what is shown here when the spinning nuclei are placed in an externally applied magnetic field they interact by aligning themselves with the magnetic field so this is externally applied no doubt the nucleus will have already its own magnetic field along with that you need to have an external magnetic field that is represented by h not don't get confused with the tiny magnetic field of the nucleus and this external magnetic field they both are different so whenever there is no external magnetic field the nuclei are randomly oriented whenever there is external magnetic field the nuclei are oriented properly they mainly orient in two directions one is parallel orientation another one is anti parallel see here this arrow mark this arrow mark they are parallel this one this that anti parallel that is what is shown here now i said that there are two important types of directions or orientations one is parallel imagine this is the external magnetic field i said it is also represented by b not b not is external applied magnetic field or you can call it as h not now this two types of orientations the parallel orientation look at the arrow marks both are in the parallel direction this parallel direction is also called alpha spin state and the anti parallel is also known as beta spin state anti parallel with respect to the magnetic field here parallel with respect to magnetic field external magnetic field here anti parallel is with respect to the magnetic external magnetic field so if it is parallel you call it as alpha spin state if it is anti parallel you call it as beta spin state always alpha spin state will be lower in energy whereas beta spin state will be higher in energy now we say that alpha and beta states as i said they do not possess same energy and hence they are not present in the equal amounts imagine we have got a nucleus present in the ground state and the nucleus present in the excited state so lower state that is ground state will have always have the lower energy whereas the excited state will always have the higher energy the alpha spin state or parallel orientation is slightly lower in energy because it is in the ground state whereas the beta spin state or anti parallel orientation will always have the higher energy now the nuclei when they are properly oriented now the question of radio waves comes into the picture now the phenomenon of nmr starts now you have a nucleus it is spinning when it spins 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 it generates its own magnetic field when its own magnetic field is generated i keep an external magnetic field when i keep an external magnetic field the nuclei will orient in two directions one is alpha direction another one is beta direction now the nuclei are properly oriented now i supply energy 
energy is nothing but electromagnetic radiation electromagnetic rays which type of electromagnetic rays i'm going to use here i'm going to use radio waves that is the smallest energy of all the electromagnetic radiations now when i give that radio waves the molecules present in the alpha state they start absorbing once it absorbs the nuclei present in the alpha state it goes to the beta state but in nmr we call the term as spin flipping that means the spin which is in parallel direction when it goes up it becomes anti parallel that is called spin flipping spin you know that spin of the nucleus plus half and minus half and flipping is nothing but your changing the direction or changing the orientation when the nuclei spin flips it is said to be in resonance with the apply radiation what is the condition for resonance resonance means whenever the molecule present in the ground state it goes to the excited state by means of spin uh, flipping and that spin flipping phenomenon is nothing but resonance and hence the name has been given as nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy now this is the figure showing the spin flipping see here uh, nuclei are in both the state alpha state and beta state there is an external magnetic field alpha state will have less energy whereas beta state will have more energy the difference between the two energies or the difference between the two states is represented by delta e now when i submit when i supply external radio frequency the energy will be absorbed by the nuclei present in the alpha state then it goes to the beta state look at the spin flipping phenomenon once the nucleus present in the alpha state goes to the beta state is that there will be a change in the orientation of the spin here it was parallel once it goes to beta state it becomes anti parallel to the external magnet nuclei of many isotopes possess a nuclear spin which results from the spinning of the nucleus about its axis an atomic nucleus bears a positive charge so its rotation produces a tiny magnetic field in other words a spinning nucleus behaves like a miniature bar magnet or a compass needle in a gas or liquid sample these tiny magnets point in random directions owing to the free motion of the particles however when a sample is placed between the poles of a strong magnet the situation changes the magnetized nuclei tend to align with the external magnetic field just as a compass needle aligns with the magnetic field of the earth nuclear spin oriented with a magnetic field results in a lower energy state than random spin on the other hand if the spin were oriented against the applied magnetic field it would result in a higher less stable energy state we can see that an external magnetic field causes splitting of the energy level of magnetized nuclei into two levels with different energies now if the sample is subjected to electromagnetic radiation of energy hv that fits the difference between the two energy levels absorption of this radiation occurs and the nuclear spin flips to the opposite orientation the process of absorbing energy and flipping the nuclear spin is called nuclear magnetic resonance the splitting of energy levels caused by a magnetic field is quite small even with the strongest magnets the difference in energy levels corresponds to radiation with a frequency of several hundred megahertz which lies in the region of radio waves with a wavelength between 50 and 200 centimeters next comes to the how much of radio frequency energy should be given for a particular kind of strength of the magnetic field it is very simple if the strength of the magnetic field is less then the amount of radio frequency should be very very less that means they are directly proportional as the strength of the magnetic field increases the amount of radio frequency also increases the strength of the magnetic field that is the externally applied magnetic field is represented by h not look at this figure here the energy is zero and because the energy is zero the magnetic field is also zero now as the magnetic field increases the frequency energy also increases so here usually this b not or h not the magnetic field unit is represented by tesla if you use a small magnetic field of 1.41 tesla then the amount of radio frequency energy required is 60 megahertz now when you increase the megahertz to 
300, then look at the amount of magnetic field. The strength of the magnetic field increases to 7.02 Tesla. And when you increase it to 500 megahertz, when the frequency energy is 500 megahertz, then as much as 11.7 Tesla, the strength of magnetic field is required. That means here the difference in energy population, it becomes delta E. It is somewhat less. It, here it is medium, whereas here it is maximum. That is what is shown in this table here. Higher the strength of magnetic field, greater the energy field. So when you use the magnetic field of 11.7 Tesla, then the difference in energy will be very, very high. So if a weak magnetic field is applied, less amount of energy is required for spin flipping. On the contrary, if a strong magnetic field is applied, a large amount of energy is required. Now, when I say the strength of magnetic field, what could be the strength of the magnetic field maximum? We call it as magnets, not just magnets. They are called superconducting magnets. These will have the fields of as high as up to 140,000 Gauss or when you express it in terms of Tesla, it becomes 14.1 Tesla. These are the very, very powerful magnets. So as much as 14.1 Tesla magnetic field can be used for NMR spectroscopy, but in general, commonly, we will use the magnetic field strength of only 1.4 Tesla or 14,000 Gauss. So whenever I use 1.4 Tesla of magnetic field, then the radio frequency energy of 60 megahertz is required for bringing 1H and 1H nucleus into resonance. And whereas for carbon-13 nucleus, it is only 15 megahertz. That means for hydrogen, you need more energy. For carbon-13 nucleus, you need less energy. For example, when the frequency is 60 megahertz, then the energy required is 5.7 into 10 raised minus 6 kilocalories per mole. Whereas when the frequency is 100 megahertz, then the energy will be 9.5 into 10 raised to minus 6 kilocalorie per mole. As the frequency in the increases, the energy also increases. I mean, we have seen the relationship between frequency and energy. As the energy increases, frequency also increases. So this is about the magnetic property of nuclei. Now coming to theory of NMR or principle of NMR. Now you imagine there are nearly 118 elements in the periodic table. Now one would be thinking, will all the 118 elements exhibit NMR? The answer is yes. Definitely not. It is no. All the nuclei will not exhibit any NMR phenomenon. The main basis for the nucleus to exhibit NMR phenomenon is the spin quantum number represented by I. I should be always greater than zero. The value of I should be greater than zero. Even if it is 0 0.001, yes, the nucleus will show NMR phenomenon. If the value of I becomes zero, then there will be no NMR phenomenon for that nucleus. Then whenever I say I, that is spin quantum number, it is definitely associated with both atomic number as well as fast number. And this table is nothing but even odd rule. If mass number is even, atomic number is even, then the spin quantum number of that nucleus will be zero. So those nucleus will, which have both atomic number and mass number even, then it will have I is equal to zero, spin quantum number is equal to zero, then the nucleus will not exhibit NMR phenomenon. When mass number is odd and atomic number is even, it will have a fraction and that nucleus will show NMR phenomenon. I have said that I should be greater than zero, let it be fraction or whole number, it doesn't matter. When both mass number and atomic number are odd, then the spin quantum number will be a whole number and definitely such nuclei will show the nuclear magnetic resonance. These are some of the examples for non-norm magnetic nuclei and magnetic nuclei. These are the nuclei which does not show NMR phenomenon since I is equal to zero. Here come to oxygen. Here 8, O, 16. 8 is atomic number, 16 is mass number. 8 is even, 16 is even, even, even. What does our, our even odd rule says? If both atomic number and mass number are even, the spin quantum number will be zero. That's why it does not show any magnetic property. No magnetic property refers to no NMR. Next coming to 6C12, that is carbon 12. 
both are even that's why zero i then here 16 yes 32 sulfur i is again zero so no nmr phenomenon coming to magnetic nucleus here mainly you will see some isotopes for example the isotope of hydrogen is h1 it is called proton it is 1 h1 1 1 both are odd 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 it will have a spin quantum number next here it is 6 c 13 6 is even 13 is odd odd even so you will have a fraction definitely it will show like that these are the nuclei it will have magnetic property because it is showing the magnetic property then the i value will be greater than zero and definitely these nucleus will show nmr phenomenon next different nucleus will take up different orientations we have shown earlier in the magnetic property of nuclei that a nucleus will take up two orientation that is the example for hydrogen and carbon but other nucleus will show different types of orientation then how to calculate the number of orientations it is by using the simple formula 2i plus 1 where i is the spin quantum number now we will have different values for i and we'll see how to calculate the orientation now first we'll take up i is equal to half substitute half in this formula 2 into half plus 1 2 2 gets cancelled so 1 plus 1 is 2 2 orientations that is the nuclei which exhibit two orientations are 1 hatch c13 f19 and p31 now i'll take the value of i is equal to 1 so i is 1 2 into 1 plus 1 2 plus 1 is 3 three orientations will be there the nuclei exhibiting three orientations are h2 and n14 then now i'll take up 3 by 2 substitute 3 by 2 in the position of i 2 into 3 by 2 2 2 gets cancelled 3 plus 1 is 4 four orientations the nuclei exhibiting four orientations are boron 11 and chloride 35 next whenever we speak of theory of nmr now we come across two important concepts saturation and relaxation we will have seen this term saturation in inorganic chemistry lab we prepare saturated solution and as well as in organic chemistry theory we say saturation saturation means no double bond or triple bond but here in nmr saturation is quite different we will see what it is we know that there are two energy states alpha spin state and beta spin state we know that also the energy states will have difference in energy the alpha will have lower energy beta will have higher energy somewhat more energy than the alpha spin state whenever i say that energy is different the population of the nuclei will also be different so the lower state that is alpha state will have quite 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 more energy how much energy it is just 0.001 percent it is shown by boltzmann distribution law boltzmann is the name of the scientist he has found out that the lower energy state will have 0.001 percent more population than the higher energy state that is the beta state or anti-parallel orientation yes it is this finite amount of finite excess of energy that is 0.001 percent you cannot just say that 0.001 percent is almost negligible what can we do with this never imagine like that this 0.001 percent the nuclei present in the lower energy state it will absorb the radio frequency energy and those nuclei will go to the higher energy state this is called the excitation in general but in nmr we call it as spin flipping those molecules those molecules which undergo excitation those molecules which undergo spin flipping if it if this was not to be present then there could be no nuclear magnetic resonance phenomenon because of this finite excess of 0.001 percent and the energy will be absorbed by such a small population they undergo spin flipping to the higher energy state now the nuclei which has already undergone spin flipping even if you supply more energy to the alpha state there will be no energy absorption because there will be no in a nuclei population in the low energy state when there is no population in the low energy state there is no question of absorption and such a phenomenon is known as saturation so what is saturation no more energy absorption takes place hence no resonance signal is observed this situation is termed as saturation saturation means 
even if you supply if you keep on giving the energy to the molecule the molecule will not have the capacity to absorb the energy and such a situation is known as saturation but the nature has provided us with an alternative mechanism whatever the it has gone to the upper state or higher energy state always it has to come back to the lower energy state by losing energy to its environment this phenomenon or this process is known as relaxation saturation and relaxation these two are the two important terms that we should understand in in mr what is saturation once the molecule which is present in the ground state it will go to the excited state and even after that if you keep on supplying the energy there will be no resonance there will be no energy absorption and this phenomenon is known as saturation but those molecule which have gone to the beta state they will not stay there itself it will come back to the original ground state that is alpha state by losing its excess energy to the environment and this process is known as relaxation there are two types of relaxation processes the first one is longitudinal or spin lattice relaxation the second one is transverse or spin spin relaxation now we will try to understand what these two mean and how does they differ i said that relaxation means it has to come back to the ground state by losing energy how does it lose energy that is what is defined here it loses energy by transferring from one nucleus to the molecular lattice so whenever there is a cell you know that there will be a molecular lattice the molecule which is present in the higher energy state the nucleus present in the higher energy state it loses its extra energy to the molecular lattice that's why it is called spin lattice relaxation the time required is explained in terms of the half life t1 if the relaxation process is called as efficient then it should involve a very very short time that means the half life should be very very short very very short then it is called as very very efficient relaxation and then if there is an efficient relaxation process then it is inversely proportional to the line width the line width is inversely proportional to the lifetime of the excited state i'll show you that in the next slide coming to the transverse or spin spin relaxation here the name is spin spin that means the energy is transferred from one spin state to the another spin state here it was from one spin state to the real molecular lattice here one nucleus is transferring the higher energy to the another nucleus that means here there is no net loss or net gain of energy because the energy is transferred from one nucleus to another nucleus and the time required for this is described in terms of half life t2 here there is no net loss or net gain of energy and this process leads to line broadening because this takes more time whenever the time is more for transferring of energy then the line broadening takes place what is narrow line what is broad line we will see here there is an important relationship between relaxation time and line broadening that can be understood by making use of uncertainty principle so delta e the difference in energy delta t the difference in time is equal to h over 2 pi h is planck's constant 2 pi again it is a constant value since e is equal to h nu we know that the famous equation substitute this h nu in term in place of delta e it becomes delta nu into delta 2 is equal to h is gets cancelled half pi half pi is again constant so delta nu into delta t definitely these two becomes inversely proportional that is what is shown here in this table if the time taken is large that is long relaxation then the delta nu is small that means the line widths are very very narrow this is how you are going to get a peak this is called a peak see here the width between the two lines is very very narrow this is called efficient relaxation process on the other hand if the time taken is small that is fast relaxation then the delta nu is large it ultimately leads to broadening of the line this is called line broadening look at this narrow line and this is broad line this is the efficient relaxation process this is not efficient relaxation process whenever there is a peak is like this you can easily integrate whenever there is a peak like this you it leads to lot of confusion so this is all about theory of nmr now coming to the next topic that is larmor precision frequency precess 
what is the process in our childhood definitely we will have played with the top a top when you spin the top the top it will spin 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 during the end it starts wobbling it starts wobbling like a top the same phenomenon occurs in the nucleus also we know that when the inner nucleus absorbs energy and the nucleus begins to process in an applied magnetic field so this is a spinning nucleus imagine this is the nucleus and this is the external magnetic field b or b not and this is the precession and towards the end the top begins to wobble see here this is the top this is the top and due to earth's gravity rotational force the top begins to wobble when it wobbles when the nucleus wobbles when the nucleus presses it creates an angular frequency that angular frequency is represented by omega so the phenomenon of precession is similar to that of a spinning top due to earth's gravitational field the top begins to wobble or presses about its own axis a nucleus spinning also behaves similarly under the influence of an external magnetic field now imagine this is the nucleus of hydrogen or any other nucleus it is spinning its own axis it is spinning 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 and when it is spinning there will be a precession there will be a wobbling when it is placed in the presence of an externally applied magnetic field so this precession definitely is comparable with that of the spinning top and this phenomenon was described by the famous scientist larmer and hence the name is given as larmer precession frequency so how do we define this larmer precession frequency when the magnetic field is applied the nucleus begins to precess about its own axis by creating an angular frequency omega and this is called larmer precession frequency the frequency at which the nucleus precesses is directly proportional to the strength of the applied magnetic field if you give more magnetic field there will be more precession if you give less magnetic field there will be less precession that is what is shown here stronger the applied field 